Hello, my name is Gabriela Diaz and I'm going to speak on the U.S.'s need to substantially reduce its military presence in West Asia and North African regions. The U.S. military presence in West Asia supports autocratic governments and this will end up undermining the U.S. democracy. In one swoop, last month's announcements by the OPEC cartel led to cut the oil production by 2 million barrels a day, which essentially ran counter to, mer to many major American interests in two, in two ways, exacerbating the U.S. energy costs at a critical time and fueling Putin's war on Ukraine. It's yet another reminder of how often Saudi Arabia and other U.S. partners, like the UAE, take actions that diverge from U.S. interests. And just days ago, the Washington Post reported that the U.S. intelligence community apparently found it necessary to produce a classified report outlining the UAE's extensive efforts to manipulate the American political system. The two instances are among the latest examples of why the United States must, re must reassess these relationships. Both highlight decades that of failed U.S. Middle East policy rooted in the support of autocrats who repeatedly pursue policies contrary to not only American, but universal values and interests. American support for the Middle East autocrats is objectionable for both moral and strategic, and strategic perspectives. Washington's Middle East partners are some of the worst human rights abusers in the world. Saudi Arabia and the UAE specifically are engaged in widespread abuses at home and support other autocrats through the region engaged in similar, in similar activities. Their leaders respectfully remain engaged in the war in Yemen, which has resulted in the world's worst humanitarian crisis and the deaths of at least 377,000 people. Both Saudi Arabia and the UAE are related below Russia in Freedom House's Index of Political Rights and Civil Liberties, with, with the UAE's leader also being ranked below China. President Joe Biden's overturns to these states have not resulted in any concrete movement on human rights. In fact, the opposite appears to be true. Since his visit to Saudi Arabia in July, both the Saudi and Emirati governments have been emboldened. Saudi Arabia's sentenced women's rights activist and academic Sama al Shabab to 34 years in prison, followed by another by a 34 year travel ban for the crime of posting tweets advocating for basic rights in the kingdom. One of the leaders' conviction, conviction adds to a number of lengthy sentences reach, recently handed to other activists and critics of the Saudi regime. Two members of the Hawati tribe were given 15-year prison terms and 50-year travel bans after they refused to be displaced from their tribal homeland, where their $500 billion new city, Neom, is under construction. While an activist and mother of five was given 45 years in prison for having an anonymous Twitter account criti critical of the Saudi Arabia, a Saudi Arabia government. A Saudi writer slash translator and computer programmer was just sentenced to, to 32 years in prison and a 72 year old Saudi American woman was sentenced by the specialized criminal court to 16 years for in prison for tweets. Likewise, days after Biden met with the UAE president, Mohammed bin Saden, the Emirates ab arbitrarily detained American lawyer Asim Ghafoor, after com convicting him in absentia of money laundering and tax evasion. U.S. strategic interests, the argument typically preferred in defense in the U.S. relationship with these rights abusers is that the ties advances U.S. strategic interests, such as holding American military units, including missile defense systems and cooperation against terrorism and containing Iran. To the contrary, however, Saudi Arabia and the UAE actually desensitize the region and, re and repeatedly pursue policies that are fundamentally at odds with American strategic interests. Can you switch to my mic?
Hi, my name is Gabriela Diaz and I'm here to speak about how the U.S. not ought to substantially reduce its military presence in the West African, no, in West Asian and North African region. Diplomacy and offshore balancing can't succeed without current levels of U.S. military presence in West Asia. Make no mistake, this is a call to repeal the Carter Doctrine, shut down the U.S. Fifth Fleet, and eliminate much of the infrastructure built over more than half a century that allows the U.S., the United States, the placement and access required to protect U.S. national security interests. This would be no mere redeployment or retrenchment. It's an argument for ending the routine production of U.S. power into the region through the air and overseas and removing all U.S. military personnel sanctioned with key partner nations. Regardless of the preferences of their leaders, no matter how artfully described such a policy, would it be immediately and correctly recognized by all regional leaders as a general U.S. withdrawal? At that point, the biggest flaw in this plan would be immediately evident. The authors assert that in order to protect U.S. interests, the United States should make greater investments in intelligent and early warning, basically seeking close coordination with regional states and engage in robust diplomacy. While these are worthy goals, in the context of general withdrawal, they are entirely, entirely unrealistic. My colleagues assume that our relationship with host country policymakers and security sector officials would freeze in place and remain after departure. They assign zero value to the day-to-day -day interactions between U.S. forces and intelligence professionals. The, inf the influence this allows the U.S. to wield and the atmospheric, atmospherics that can be gathered as a result. They ignore the, cri the critically of, of military relationships building and how the strength of those relationships transferred transfers into improved interoperability and common strategic perspective. They ascribe limited agency to US partners, assuming that these partners will not feel will not feel abandoned by the United States and seek out alternative arrangements to meet their security needs. You can search a lot of things, but as Admiral Willem McRaven has said, you can't search trust. Furthermore, the cause for greater reliance on diplomacy in the region would come as a surprise to almost every modern U.S. president, with Trump perhaps the sole exception, and the secretaries of state, each of whom dedicated disproportionate time to exactly that. Presidents Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton became the personal action officers for diplomacy at Camp David between Israel and Egypt and between Israel and the Palestinians. Respectfully, U.S. Ex Secretary of State Henry Kissinger first made an art of shuttle diplomacy in the region and Secretaries James, ba James Baker and John Kerry proudly boasted of the number of trips they had taken there. President George H.W. Bush spent countless hours on the personal diplomacy necessary to build a coalition to liberate Kuwait and thus restore the status quo, while his son, who upended the status quo, had regular personnel calls to the leaders of, our, of Iraq and Afghanistan. This diplomacy was possible only in the wild, wider context of American military strength, a self-evident linka linkage of hard power and diplomatic prowess, basically that the only reason why we're able to, to keep these nice relationships between Iraq and, and Afghanistan and Kuwait is because of the military power we had in those countries. Now that Russia has re-entered the region militarily, it is to successfully leverage its newfound position for its diplomatic end. At the same time, for formal regional powers that have a long, long since withdrawal military, do not tend to find themselves at the center of regional diplomacy. A simple trade-off seeking to replace military power with diplomatic power is wishful thinking at best. This approach is particularly infeasible when applied to U.S. counterterrorism objectives. The authors argue that adequate counterterrorism capacity can be maintained properly with more robust access agreements and cooperation from local partners. Without explaining how access agreements are supposed to improve the context of U.S. withdrawal 
or how the United States is supposed to maintain cooperation with people who feel it is in the process of deserting them. Which basically means that how can people trust the United States if they feel that we are basically abandoning them by taking away all military presence in that country. The approach assumes, as my colleague, as I, as colleagues in my source write, that the threat is mostly local and manageable with only a small residual U.S. military presence, if if that. In reality, in reality, there is no way that we can keep up diplomatic relationships with other countries if we completely remove or even reduce by a major amount of military presence in these regions. Thank you.